Yesterday was really the first time that I really came off the practice field and felt like now there was our first football practice. Yet another week goes by without Temple football, but around the rest of college football, big things are happening. Especially in the American Athletic Conference, we've got you covered as Temple's future foes get underway with their season. We're just two weeks away, a little over two weeks away from the start of the kickoff of the Temple football season, but you don't have to wait for another edition of Inside the Nest because it starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome into a new edition of Inside the Nest. Alongside Dom Gillespie and Adam Cornally, I'm Ray Dunn. Another week of waiting for Temple football has passed. But the SEC is set to kick off this weekend and the Big Ten announces it will have a season. Just now, it starts on October 24th. Plus, Navy battled another conference foe over the weekend and let's just say if you turn that game off at halftime, you missed a thing or two. But let's not talk about that just yet. Let's talk about practice and the start of full practices for Temple football. The past six months, it has all been about how can we safely and efficiently get things done. When it came to football, the question was how can teams be ready for game day without a real practice leading up to the season? For the Owls, that is no longer an issue. That's right, Dom. Last week, Rod Carey announced that Temple has been cleared for full practices with no restrictions. Along with that good news, Temple also was officially cleared to have all of their games played at the link, at least for their home games, of course. That first home game will take place on October 17th against USF. But let's not talk about that game right now. First up, Navy in Annapolis. Navy is another school that struggled with COVID-19 guidelines and full practices. This program said this was the reason for its opening season blowout loss to BYU 55-3 earlier this month. But the midshipmen had a chance to right the ship against Tulane last Saturday. This one got out of hand early. The green wave crashed on top of the midshipmen, moving quickly down the field and getting a three-yard score from Cameron Carroll. Their offense continued to look electric as Fat Watts takes this second quarter run in for the score. After a field goal, Tulane had pushed their lead to 17-0, but the Navy defense began to turn the tide. They allowed one more score after this sack, before their offense woke up in the second half with this Nelson Smith touchdown. But this is where things really turn around, Ray. This safety. Tulane running back Cameron Carroll tries bouncing it to the outside. He is unsuccessful, and we got a one-score game on our hands. 2020 is a year for weird things, right? Anything can happen. Here's Navy passing the ball. Dallin Morris finds Michael Cooper for the score. Navy would go for two and convert. The midshipmen would hold Tulane to a turnover on downs to set up this game-winning field goal from 33 yards to mount the monstrous comeback. 27 to 24 is the final as Navy evens up its record to one and one. The midshipmen sure have been getting in some work. Before they are set to play the Owls on October 10th, they will already have had three games under their belt. Coming up this weekend, they will take on Air Force, and following next weekend will be the heavily anticipated matchup between Navy and Temple. Both the Falcons and the Owls will be playing their first games against the midshipmen. A lot of fresh meat on deck for the boys in blue. Temple will be the first in a long line of AAC opponents as ECU and Houston loom in the distance, all of whom won a shot at Navy as they are projected to finish sixth in the conference, which is higher than their first four AAC opponents. Well, you don't prepare any different than if it was game one for both of us. Uh, there, there's nothing you can do. Um, we try to make practice harder than games as far as tempo and hitting an amount and volume and all those things that we do. So when you get to games, it's a little easier, but game speed is game speed. I think John asked me this question last week, uh, is that a positive or a negative? And I think it's one and the same. Uh, the fact that, you know, they're not going to have any film on us. We're going to film on them from this year's team. So that's positive for us. Obviously they have game reps. We don't, that's positive for us and negative or positive for them, negative for us. So uh, they're both the same thing right there. Our quarterback room is way better than it was last year. And that's no slight to the guys who were there last year, but Trad's improvement and then Real and what he brings has pushed Russo. And that is a true, like, hey, you better button up and play every drill and every rep 
Um, Cause if you don't, this guy's nipping at this guy's heel and then that switches who's nipping at whose heel. And the whole, it's pushed the whole room through the competition better is really creating a group of starters and trying to say, Hey, normally there are 11 starters on offense, for example. Right. Well, let's try to get that to 18 or 19 that we feel good and, and say that these guys, and then inside of that, that these five guys can play a bunch of different positions and making it very versatile so that if something happens, because we're going to test now the day before the game, before we get on that bus, that that's not going to knock us out of that game. This group of leaders has had more to deal with than any group of leaders I've been around. And they've handled it well. And the biggest thing they've done, and they've been forced to do this, but they've communicated to the team and back up to the coaches better than any group of leaders I've had. And that's, they've been forced to it, right? Cause a lot of it's been over zoom. And that's the only interaction you got with people uh, in some kit for a long time with this team. Coach Carey still has a few weeks to prepare for Navy, but there's still a lot of open competition going on in the Owls locker room inside the nest reporter Sage Hurley joins us to talk more about one of those battles. Thanks, Adam. Some normalcy might just be setting in as the Owls finally have a week's worth of real practices under their belt. The city of Philadelphia loosened its health restrictions and the field at Edberg Olsen is finally full with players ready to compete at all positions, even quarterback. Head coach Rod Carey and quarterbacks coach Craig Harmon agree that Anthony Russo is firmly seated at QB1 but that doesn't mean there isn't a healthy dose of competition. There is a big time competition going on there. And certainly Russo is our starter. Just because someone's a starter doesn't mean they don't have people chasing them. And competition is really good for everybody. The guy has an off day, man. He's gonna have someone nipping at his heels pretty quick. The quarterback's room is full of talent with a pair of redshirt sophomores in number 11, Trad Beatty, and number 17, transfer Real Mitchell, vying for snaps. I'm like a kid at Christmas with a lot of gifts. There's a lot of special talent in my room. Trad's improvement has really just been phenomenal. And Real just has such a unique skill set. He's such an electric athlete uh, and throws the ball very, very well. Despite the competition, Russo is a leader for the younger quarterbacks who are looking to make a difference on the field. We're all there to compete. Um, you know, like I said before, football is a fun, a fun game to be a quarterback, but also tough because one guy plays. And a lot of times you hear with the quarterback position, every throw is an interview. But Russo and I have a great relationship. You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, talking scheme, talking plays off the field. I uh, can't say enough about Russo. I don't shy away from competition ever, I think, you know. Competition brings out the best in all of us. Anthony obviously is the one that's getting, you know, the majority of the snaps um, here at camp and, you know, just trying to learn from him. Russo threw just shy of 3,000 yards last season with 21 touchdowns. However, he also threw for 12 interceptions. Last year, he shared time with Todd Santeo, who is now at Colorado State. But at this point, Kerry does not want to run a 2QB system this year. Reporting for Inside the Nest, I'm Sage Hurley. Thanks, Sage. It's time for us to take our first break of the show. But like the Carpenters once sang, we've only just begun here on Inside the Nest. When we come back, hear from our own Josh Safran as he takes a look into the Owls running back room. And later, our weekly staple, No Huddle. Inside the Nest, we'll be right back. Bye-bye. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water too. That'll probably help. You were probably gonna turn down the radio too, so you could focus, right? Probably okay isn't okay. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. Welcome back to Inside the Nest. This past week, the Division I Council continued its fight against systemic racism. The NCAA passed legislation that states no athletes will compete or practice on the first Tuesday after November 1st. That first Tuesday is always an election day. This year, it falls on November 3rd, the day of the 2020 presidential election. 
This marks the first legislative proposal the D1SAAC has proposed since the governance was restructured back in 2014, which gave student-athletes a vote at every level of decision-making. Another important vote to members of the Temple football team is the vote for who gets to wear the single digits. Last week, we took a look at the new single digits, but let's not forget about the returning leaders to this squad. The wide receiver room boasts two grad year single digits in number zero, Randall Jones, and number one, Brandon Mack. On the other side of the ball, defensive tackle Daniel Archibong donning number six, and linebacker Isaiah Graham Mobley donning number eight are expected to lead an inexperienced front seven this season. One position group lacking a single digit is running back, but that certainly does not mean there's a lack of talent in that group. Here's Inside the Nest reporter Josh Chaffron with more. Thanks, Ray. And no single digits in the running backs room, true. But that certainly won't be the story for long with someone as young and talented as Raymond Davis, who refers to himself as Mr. Heisman on Twitter. The unknown for Temple this season, who will take snaps when Mr. Heisman needs a breather? It did not take long for the freshman out of the 415 to make a name for himself in the 215. San Francisco native Raymond Davis took the reins of starting running back in just the second game of last season. This season, the starting spot is his to lose. But make no mistake, this year's backfield has competition all around. When one person makes a mistake, we're all going to get on it. If another person does something good, we're all going to praise him. None of us are trying to be that leader. None of us is trying to be the head honcho. We're all individually, you know, having the same type of uh, leadership within each other. And we all hold each other accountable. And, you know, that's one thing that I truly love about this room is no one's trying to be that guy. The shared accountability is most likely a result of the Owls returning five healthy running backs this season. While the starting spot is all but locked up, Rod Carey and his staff have a problem many coaches would desire. How do the Owls share the wealth in the running backs room? You know, I, I tell our backs all the time, you, you, you eat what you kill. Our ability to be productive in practice is only going to feed us more. And I tell them, it's hard to feed all, you, you, all, all these mouths. I got five mouths I got to feed, I got one ball. Maybe the hungriest out of all the running backs is senior Tavon Ruley, who attended Valley Forge Military Academy for two years before transferring to Temple last season, where in 2019 he only carried the ball 24 times. I know there's a lot of people that doubted me. I know I had conversations, I heard things, a lot of people that doubted me, but I always told myself, like, you know yourself, so don't ever let nobody bring you down by what they say. The unproven senior stint in junior college had less to do with his ability and more to do with a low grade point average. Ruley called himself a bit of a jokester in high school, but it appears Valley Forge Military Academy has gotten him on the right track, much like it did for other alumni, such as Larry Fitzgerald. Reporting for Inside the Nest, I'm Josh Safran. Adam, back to you. Thanks, Josh. Speaking of Larry Fitz, let's take a look at the Owls in the NFL. This season is going to be a little bit different when we do this segment. Instead of going through all the former Owls that played on 10th and Diamond, we're going to focus our attention on the group led by first-year NFL head coach and former Temple head coach Matt Rule and the Carolina Panthers. The Owls have six players in Charlotte, along with a coaching staff filled with Temple experience, too. The Panthers lost in a nail-biter week one that finished on a fourth and inches try marked short of the line to gain. That was week one. Week two brought even more headlines tied to the cherry and white. For the first time in program history, two former Temple head coaches faced off against each other as head coaches in the NFL when the Carolina Panthers took on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this past Sunday. Matt Rule and Bruce Arians went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with the proper social distancing, of course, in an NFC South battle. Rule spent four years on Broad Street, and Arians spent the better half of five. The Bucs got the better of the Panthers this time, but the teams are set to play each other again November 15th. As mentioned, the Panthers roster six former Temple players, and that's tops in the NFL. Outsports Update's Chris Bogardis was at Rule's weekly presser with more. Hey, Matt. Uh, I'm Chris Bogardis with Outsports Update, Temple University. Uh, for the first time in Temple history, there are two former coaches going head-to-head -head as head coaches in the NFL with you and Coach Arians. What does this mean to you, and what does it say about the program and the deep ties you still have to the guys on North Broad and 10th and Diamond? Um, well, I think, I think uh, Coach Arians gave me a tremendous piece of advice when I first took the job at Temple. He said, um, he said don't, don't pay attention to what you don't have. You know, don't pay attention to what the weight room looks like or anything like that. Pay attention to what you do have. 
and uh, Temple's greatest asset is its people. And um, I found that to be true. You know, and what's unique is when I was the head coach there, you know, we had some, you know, we had some down times. We had some great times. Uh, it was the guys that, that played for Coach Arians, the guys who played for Coach Harden, um, and many more. But, but a lot of those guys were, were instrumental in, in, in giving back to the program and giving tremendous energy, whether it was Paul Palmer or, you know, Todd Bowles and many, 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 many more. Um, so I just think that's what Temple's about. Temple's about uh, great people. And I think it's because, you know, you have to be a tough person uh, to go to Temple. You have to be a person that um, finds a way to get things done. And um, uh, that's what, you know, our staff has tried to be. That's what Coach Arians and his staff are. And I think what's really cool is if you look at the, you know, the coaching staff at Tampa Bay and you look at the coaching staff here, a lot of his assistant coaches and, and people, a lot of our assistant coaches and support staff all were with us both when we were at, uh, at Temple. And that's because um, when, 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 you've, when, when you were there, when you were on 10th and Diamond, um, you know, you build something special together. It's time to take our final time out. No time out. Time for our favorite segment next on Inside the Nest. This week, Ray is putting Dom and me in the hot seat. Don't you even think about touching that remote. Much like the Temple offense, when we come back, it's time to go no huddle. Dom and Adam, I hope you're ready for some QB questions and some AAC prognostication because you better believe I am. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Welcome back to Inside the Nest. The only three teams that have not played a game yet in the AAC are Houston, ECU, and Temple. The rest of the conference is alive and well. Cincinnati won over Austin P 55-20. Tulsa dropped its opener against the 16th ranked Oklahoma State team 16 to 7 and as we mentioned earlier Navy's 27 unanswered points propelled the midshipmen to a win over Tulane 27 to 24. As we move down the list let's take a look Notre Dame went bull riding over the weekend as they ran up one heck of a tab when they took down South Florida by a score of 52 to nothing. The Golden Knights won a very convincing game against former Owls head coach Jeff Collins 49 to 21. Dylan Gabriel surely had himself a day. Finally, a good old-fashioned Southern shootout. SMU steamrolls Northern Texas by a score of 65 to 35. For all the math majors out there, that is 100 total points scored in one football game. Someone ought to tell these teams defense wins championships, but offense does make for better highlight reels. That's right, no huddle is back. Guys, Dom got the ball rolling last week, but this week Ray has Dom and me in the hot seat. Ray, should we be worried? <laughs> Always, Adam, but that has little to do with no huddle. Back on topic, no huddle is here with an added twist this year. One of us asks the questions, and the other two, unaware of the questions, give their answers with little to no preparation. So let's get this thing started. Earlier in the show, Sage Hurley dived into the quarterback room and what's going on there. So that leads me to the question, do you two believe that Anthony Russo will start all eight games for the Owls this season? We'll start with you, Adam. Will he start every game? Right, I mean, when you think about that quarterback room last year with Todd Santeo getting a drive or two a game, you would think that maybe they'd run the same thing this year. But, you know, as Coach Carey said earlier in the show, sounds like they don't want to do that this year. He, was, he sounded really adamant about that. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go with yes. For now, I'm going to say Russo's got the experience. I hope that he's had a good productive offseason. You know, I think that his main problem last year was taking care of the football. There's 12 interceptions. That's a high number. If he does that, I mean, he has the experience. He has the weapons. He has the chemistry. I think he's probably the guy. But, hey, there's a lot of open competition in that locker room right now. So we'll have to wait and see. I'm going to disagree, Adam. You looked at what happened last season. We played Temple played Todd Senseo a lot. And he really brought a different dynamic to the offense. 
And then you look at Russo, he's going into his fourth season. I haven't really seen a lot of progression since he started playing his sophomore year. And you're going to need a quarterback that can do it with his legs. That's why I think Real's going to get the job eventually. you got to have someone who can bring that dynamic on third down, scamper, and get those third and shorts, do it with their legs. Russo's not really that guy. And if you really want a pocket presence quarterback, you really someone, want someone with pocket toughness, you're going to need someone that can take care of the football. And as Sage Hurley previously mentioned, Russo threw 12 interceptions last year. That's got to be a warning sign. If he comes out firing the first four games, obviously they're not going to take him out. But uh, I think you'd really have to light up the stat sheet for them to uh, continue with him. The Real deal, baby. I agree with you, Dom. I think this is Real Mitchell's job by the end of the season. But this isn't my time to debate. Let's jump to the running back room where Josh Saffron broke down earlier the situation going on there. Ray Davis is solidified in his role. But that second supplementary back, who do you guys believe it's going to be this season? Dom, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm probably going to go with Kyle Dobbins in this situation. We heard a lot about him last season. He didn't really see the field that much. Um, speculation is that he can't really pass block that well, but he is a very, very dynamic back. He can do it all, but I think they'll be playing a very secondary role to Ray Davis, a true freshman, third team all AAC. I really liked what I saw about, out of him last year. He can do it all as well. Uh, I think the first game about now he had a receiving touchdown. As a true freshman running back, that's something to really behold. Uh, I really like what I saw from him, though. I think Ray Davis is going to be the starting back all season long, and maybe Dobbins will play a secondary role to him, but carries will not be even by any stretch of the imagination. Ray will carry the workload. Yeah, Dom, I, I agree with you. Ray, Ray's their guy. Ray's their main guy. We saw it last year. Not you, Ray Dunn. Let's not get you in Pez just yet. Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, Ray Dunn had a fantastic freshman year, and C Coach Gabe Infantes basically said he's like that quote-unquote leader in that locker room. I wrote up on this a little bit for our Al Sports Update page, and shout-out to them. You know, go check out our website. We're going to be posting articles, but... I mean, you, you look at that running back room, I'm taking Tavon Ruley. You, you look at his storyline, I mean, it's such a great story, you know, he, he finally gets into that end zone with a limited, um, you know, touches and a, and a touch that goes into the end zone last season, ends up with a scholarship, you know, he's, he's the oldest, you know, he's, he's that uh, redshirt senior, I believe, uh, he, he's gonna, he said he was actually gonna come back next season as well, I mean, this guy's been fighting just to get on the field, uh, you know, getting that scholarship. That, that means the team has uh, praise for him. The, the coaching staff likes what they see. And I think you, you want some experience back there, and he has some experience. Dobbins is that big home run hitter. You know, like, he, he can break off for a 60-yard run every now and then. But um, I feel like the carries will be Ray and then Ruley, and then there's a few other guys besides Dobbins, too, that could come in. It, it's pretty open, it sounds like, in that locker room. I absolutely agree. Ray does carry the workload. Ray is going to get a lot of carries. Ray is great. He's the guy. Um, and I'm talking Not about, you, Ray. I'm Ray talking Davis. about on this show. That's what I'm discussing. As Ray, for the running, running back room, Edward Sadie, uh, I think, is going to be that second back. The coaches seem to really like him. But, hey, that's just my two cents on the question I asked. All right, let's look big picture here. AAC football is underway. Who are you guys picking to win the conference this year? Let's start. Let's go out. Let's go at AAC champs, I'm going, I like SMU a lot, I, I really do, you, you look at Bouchel back there, I mean, he's he's one heck of a talent, you know, he's coming over from Texas, he, he's got big game experience, um, and you just look at the, the weapons they have, think about that Temple game, they torched the Temple secondary, um, and, and they started off well. Um, so far, I, I like what I see out of them, and I think it continues to carry over moving forward. You got a good quarterback. You can build around that. I'm going with them. Maybe it's a little bit of a dark horse, but I'm going with them. Yeah, uh, Adam here. I'm going to have to go with the favorite in UCF. I really like the game I saw from them against Georgia Tech. I love SMU. Their offense is very high-powered, and they love to air the ball out. They can. Their running back is really good, too. Um but it's got to be UCF for me. Their de SMU's defense raises a lot of questions. Letting up 35 points against Northern Texas has got to raise some eyebrows. UCF only let up 21 against Georgia, Georgia Tech. And Dylan Gabriel is a dog. Pro Football Focus says he's one of the top 10 best quarterbacks in all of college football. So you got to go with the better quarterback in that situation, whether it is Bouchelle or D uh, Dylan Gabriel. I like Dylan Gabriel. I'm taking UCF to win. All right. Well, that UCF is where I was going to go for a little sense of difference. I like Cincy's chances, too. But let's move along. Let's move away from football for a little bit. The Equinox was the other day. It's officially fall. I'm asking you guys, what is your favorite fall activity? Dom, let's start with you. Favorite fall activity. All right. Um, damn, you put me on the spot here. Um, I really like going. Uh, I mean, I love Halloween. 
I love Halloween, I love dressing up, but I'm gonna have to go with like pumpkin patches and stuff like that. It's a really fun place to go, um, maybe with a lady friend, maybe with uh, just a couple of your guy friends going out, getting in the outdoors, wearing some uh, some sweatshirts, maybe a little flannel, some fall jackets, who knows. Uh, I really like it, it's enjoyable. I love the outdoors, I can't be cooped up inside. That's why this has been, this situation has been so difficult for me. <laughs> Yeah, Dom, I, I definitely hear you. As you can see, I'm kind of a shoe guy. I uh, love rocking some Tims during the uh, the fall years, the flannels. Like Dom said, I'm all about the fall. It's probably in some ways maybe my favorite um, my favorite season. In some ways, I, I love Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving makes me think about eating food. I, I love the good home, good food that you get in the fall time. But um, like Dom said, I feel like you can't beat it. You know, going out in, into the nature, pumpkin picking, maybe carving pumpkins. I mean, all that stuff is just really great. I love doing that stuff. Pumpkin pie rolls around. I mean, it, it's it's my favorite time of year. Like I said, it's it's always great to get out, do different things, and do things with a group of people or, or a small group right now, and just try and stay safe. But I hear you, Dom. I want to get out there because it's a great time of year, and it's nice weather usually. Football season, right? Yeah, I thought that was where the, the conversation was going to go, but we found out that Dom himself is a romantic, and I, we're very glad to know about that. But I'm... I'm big on the sweats, gray sweatshirt, gray sweatpants, grout fit season, it's night, you get to bundle up a little bit, and I'm good on just sitting on the couch and watching football, so you'll see you guys outside, I'll be inside, nice and cooped up. <laughs> Alright, let's wrap this one up, last question here for No Huddle, the best position group on this Temple football team, Adam, we'll start with you. Best position group, easily, wide receiving, wide receiving crew, it's tight, it's experienced, Jaden Blue had a great year. Brandon Mack had a great year. You got three single digits. Randall Jones coming off that red shirt year. He's an experienced guy. He's a leader in the locker room. Easy. Wide receivers. I don't think anyone could disagree with you there, Adam. It's got to be the wide receivers. Like you said, three returning single digits. Jaden Blue eclipsed 1,000 yards last year, not even as a single digit. That season, he was kind of a breakout star. Rod Carey didn't really see it that way. He knew Jaden had the talent. You go back to two years ago, I think Jaden only had a handful of catches, and he absolutely burst onto the scene last year. One of the best receivers in the AAC. Best slot receiver in the AAC, in my opinion. So it's got to be those wide receivers. You got Brandon Mack. Uh, he said last year, any jump ball's got to be his. So hopefully we'll see a little bit of that action. Big bodied receiver. I think he's 6'5". It's got to be receivers for me. Yeah, it's got to be receivers for the reason you guys went there. Mack, Blue, throw Randall Jones in there with his health. Jose Barbone going to get some tick this season. So you're, you're looking at a really experienced and talented crew. But that'll do it for uh, this edition of uh, No Huddle. I'd be curious to see who people thought presented the better debates. But, you know, we'll leave that to social media. And we'll leave that to what we got to plug on later. And that's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Nest. Do not forget to follow us on social media and catch the newest edition of Owl Sports Update this Friday on social with a brand new anchor duo of JJ Myhowski and Courtney Murphy getting ready to bring you all you Owl fans need to know, the latest coverage from news from Temple Soccer, and one former Owl making a big splash professionally. It's all there for you on our social media platforms at Owl Sports Update. As for us, that's all the time we have for this edition of Inside the Nest. Be sure to tune back in next week as we close it in on Temple's football season beginning. He's Ray Dunn. He's Dom Gillespie. Inside the Nest will be back next week, same time, same place. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. Stay safe.